Fear Not, Episode 93. Hi, I'm Billy Atwell, and I believe that consistently facing your fears is the only way to realize your truest self and to make those confident choices that will help you to obtain your deepest held hopes and dreams. I have faith that this podcast series will show you that you are not alone, that it will strengthen you and give you courage to face your fears, and that it will help you to permanently cross over into a life of living beyond your fears. Join me on this journey as we listen and learn from others as they share their experiences in facing and overcoming their own fears. The legendary Patty Palmer spent over three decades developing the Palmer plush tissue fitting method. This technique allows you to create clothes that fit your body rather than rigidly adhering to the pattern's contours. Palmer plush fitting workshops and online courses are designed for both the beginner and advanced sewist and provides a polished piece that looks custom made. For more information on the available Palmer plush fitting workshops and online courses, visit palmerplush.com. P-A-L-M-E-R-P-L-E-T-S-C-H dot com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show today. You and I are going to be joined by Dr. Lee Balcom. Welcome, Lee. How are you today? Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Are you ready to fear not today? I am ready. Lee is the author of Thrive Principles, where he outlines 15 strategies to help anyone build a thriving life. He's also the creator of Save the Marriage System, the author of two best-selling books on saving relationships, Lee brings a coach's attitude to his training as a therapist. Over the last three decades, Lee has coached and consulted with individuals and organizations around the world. His expertise in thriving has transformed individuals, couples, families, and organizations from stuck to excellence. Every week, Lee hosts two podcasts and co-hosts a third. The Thrivology Podcast and Save the Marriage Podcast provides self-help and relational success. As co-principal of the Impact Coaching Academy, Lee also co-hosts the Impact Coaching Podcast. The Academy and the podcast are designed to help individuals become impactful coaches. Lee, can you take a few extra moments to fill in the gaps and maybe also give us a brief glimpse of your personal life? (laughs) <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of gaps in there. But yeah, uh, so I started out my training as a therapist, as you said, and along the way, really at the very tail end, as I was writing my dissertation, I turned to my wife after reading an article and said, hey, you know what? I, I think I'm a coach. And so that took a, a kind of a turn, a detour. I did some training. Uh, this is early on in the days of life coaching as even a, a profession. I did training as a, a coach in that and uh, followed that up with with really trying to, to direct my life towards helping people to grow. Grow. Along the way, uh, I did write uh, a program, the Save the Marriage uh, pro- system, that is uh, still available online. And a- a- what I was trying to do at that point was really to help people figure out how to thrive. That, that's kind of been my whole thrust. My, my concern is that we are, are always functioning from this idea of a deficit. And, and I always believe that it's not about surviving, but about thriving. And I've, I've been studying that for so long that uh, I really wanted to make a difference in how people thrive in their life. The interesting thing about that, and that's uh, talking about a fear place, the interesting thing about that was uh, there came a day when I realized I had not been applying that to my own life. I'd been teaching people, working with people, but had neglected my own health, my own diet, my own exercise, and uh, got sick. Um, sick enough that the doctor um, felt like there was, uh, I remember the phone call, an 89% likelihood of uh, full disability and that what I had would lead to dying. Um, that Neither one of those happened. I, I was fortunate. But it woke me up. And so one of the things that I talk about now is that I'm on bonus time, that I'm really uh, now I feel a lot freer, you know, that that I now have this this time I didn't think I was going to have for about a year. I didn't think I was going to have much more time. And so I really began to focus on how do you how do you bring this to a wider audience? How do I talk about this? And that that's part of what's behind uh, the book, The Thrive Principles and the podcast and a lot of the other programs I've done to kind of bring people up to speed on not just how to kind of make it through life, but how to really um, find their way to thriving. Would would you also share with us, you know, one of the biggest fears that you've had to face and and how you approach that? 
Yeah, so probably a little, let me take a step back and say I have a, a little bit of a different stance. So I, I believe that there are some automatic fears that we have that are, are really survival uh, fears. And uh, so I'm going to kind of drop those to the side. Those are the fears like when I'm running down uh, the trail and suddenly there's something squiggly in front of me, you know, I have a sudden fear response that there might be something dangerous. Those are kind of those um, momentary scares. And I don't think they're the big fears that matter in life. And so one of my core beliefs is that we have these two parts to our our way down belief systems. Our, you know, they're our core beliefs. And one side of that are our, our fears, but the other side of that are our aspirations, and they are mirror images of each other. So when I talk with couples who tell me how fearful they are that their, their relationship is going to fall apart, it's going to be disconnected, and you know they're not going to like each other, I also know that they have an aspiration for having a very connected, uh, thriving relationship. And so whatever we find ourselves at that place of fear, I'm always asking the question of what's the aspiration that's on the other side. And, and as a part of that, I always try to use fear. Uh, a lot of times people end up thinking of fear as kind of an avoidance indicator. It, it, it tells you what to avoid. And I like to think of it as an importance indicator that it's just telling me that there's something important that's tied to something bigger. And, and so to use that as a context, one of my big fears is um, that a part of the messages that I want to get out, I just don't get them out, you know, that, that something happens along the way that, that I either don't say it clearly or I can't really get it out, uh, which is why I spend a lot of time, you know, I, I fight that fear by doing a lot of content, doing a lot of writing and the podcasting uh in my hopes that that message, that there's something else, there's a bigger thing out there, there's there's meaning and there's purpose, and there are ways to make an impact in life that can be heard. So probably my biggest fear really is that I just play too small in that and, and can't get the message out there. So how do you flip it from to the other side? Yeah, so uh, the big thing I focus on is um, that for me, the whole idea of thriving is really bigger than me. Uh, I mean, I'm not I'm not creating ideas that weren't there. I've studied other ideas and um, and have kind of moved them around a little bit. But I recognize that there are lots of others on that trail. So I don't have to say, well, you know, I'm forging the trail. I just want to help people understand it. And so the biggest thing I have to do is get my ego out of the way and go back to the, the message, uh, to uh, focus on the fact that there are people who are stuck, the people who are hurting and people who need to thrive. And that whether it's in relationships, when I work with people who are in uh, hurting relationships, or whether it's just in life, that they are stuck and frozen, um, that I, I have to move to that. Uh, whenever, whenever we're having these big existential fears, one of the things that we realize is the ego is the big piece of it. Yeah, you know, that's it keeps us stuck because we end up always going, "What if? You know, what if people see this? What if someone thinks this about me? What if I don't make it? What if I, you know, whatever?" Uh, and so, those those pieces um, to me are, are just. A, a refocus. Uh, when I get up in the morning and, uh, Billy, you're probably the same thing. You know, you do a podcast and you put it out there and you realize that suddenly you freed something up for anybody to listen to and they're happy to tell you whether they like it or not. And at some point you have to recognize that it's not about, uh, you know, whether they like me or not, but whether that message was something that resonated with other people. I just had a thought and I was going to drop it because it, I, you, you did sort of touch on a nerve that, you know, because it's not really about whether people like you or not. It, it's just kind of doing what you're supposed to do and just leaving it at that. I mean, you have to let go at a certain point. Yeah, I think that you lead with message. You lead with uh, – there's there are just things that are bigger than – each of us as individuals. There's something corporate about us. Let's let's move to something better. If I look around, what a, one of the things I notice is that when we're stuck, it's almost always ego. You know, if you turn your attention to politics, and I'm not pointing to anything or anyone, but it's the ego of people involved rather than saying, you know, what's for the better of the world, the community, the nation. Uh, and that's when things happen. Whenever we get stuck on our own little world, our own little ego, that's when we get stuck. Lee, you you clearly have a, a, a clear perspective on how to handle fear and how to approach it. You must have come across some 
pretty amazing resources, whether they be books or, or courses, et cetera. Would you mind sharing some of those with us today? You know, part of what I uh, have recognized is that there are some philosophies back there that let us think about, for instance, a, a popular one right now is Stoicism. And I, I found a lot of, of the places where Stoicism talks about what we can and cannot control. That's one of the biggest distinguishing resources I have is, you know, whenever I'm faced with a situation, my response is to ask, what is it that I can control? And what can I do about that? That and, and do it. And what is it I can't control? And the things I can't control, you know, I have to I have to let them be. Uh, one of the principles I have, this is um, uh, a part of my book, is the what is, and that's accepting what is. You know, we always struggle with what is and and deal a whole lot with what if, and that's that's an idea from uh, way back. You know, that we really have to just accept where things are right now, the way they are. I notice that people do one of two things: they either uh, keep struggling with what's already happened, the what what was, or they struggle with the what ifs and and feel anxious, and uh, and so w that resource that I draw from often is uh, a, a couple of things. One is uh, the Stoic beliefs about the world and how how we're messed up in the world. You know how and, and the biggest place we're messed up. It's in our thinking. You know, we, we step back into our fears and let our fears dictate because we're not clear about the things we can't control. Um, I also draw a lot just on on faith. Uh, I believe that we are here for a bigger purpose. I believe that we're created. And in fact, I would say that we humans have a unique capacity of, of finding meaning, of having purpose and creating an impact in the world. That's the little triad I talk about is the meaning, purpose, impact. And that as far as I know, my dog doesn't lie around thinking about what something has meant to him and his experience. He might enjoy it, but I, I don't think he's pulling any meaning out of it. And I don't believe he thinks a whole lot about his purpose. I, I, th I think he serves a purpose, but I don't think he thinks about that like we humans can. And and so part of uh, the resources I understand uh, are from that vein. So stoicism is one. Uh, Viktor Frankl's writing is a, another one. Um, I often return back to his thoughts about how no matter what's going on, you can draw meaning from that. Um, and th there are other books on fear, but you know that the biggest one that I uh, have pulled from is the fact that fear is always pointing me in the direction of what's important. Um, one of the things that I uh, have worked on a daily basis is when I feel some fear, I probably ought to follow up on it. You know, I probably ought to move toward the fear, not away from it. Last week I had a client who said, you know, how do I stop the fear? And I said, why do you want to stop the fear? Why not move towards the fear? Don't let the fear dictate your actions. Choose your actions, but let the fear just show that that path is important. If it wasn't important, you you wouldn't care. You know, I always often use the example if you're if you're at a dance and and you look across the room and you see someone across the room and you go, "Ah, you know, they're kind of nice. I might want to go talk to them." That's no big deal. But if you look across and you see that person that you think, "Wow, that could be the person of my life. That could be my life partner." And you feel the fear, the butterflies and the anxiety of that. That's not telling you to not go talk to that person. It's telling you that's exactly what you should do. And in some ways, the fear is pointing the direction uh, you need to follow. Uh, when, whenever I'm in a relationship, uh, a friendship or whatever, where there, it's just kind of blah, you know, there's, there's nothing to it. I know that because there's no emotional response. And the same with opportunities. Um, I usually rank my opportunities on how much they trigger my fears of following through on them. Are you ready for the speed run? I am ready. What individual, whether they be fiction or real, has made the most impact on your life? Oh, uh, probably uh, my grandfather. Uh, he was always the the supportive person. He took me behind. Well, I stayed at his house for a couple of weeks every summer, and um, and he took me behind his pigeon 
coop. He he raised pigeons and, and would talk to me. His first words were sunny. And after that, it was just followed with you know, wisdom. And uh, what I watched from him was a loving, gracious man um, who was always positive about life, always positive about the people around him, and always saw a better path. Um, he, he died way too young, but left a huge impact on me just because of, of how he lived a life of integrity and of graciousness. If you could instantly change one thing in the world, what would you change? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I would always say world peace <laughs> because uh, I think that's a, a given. But um, I, I think if I could change one thing, it, it's the orientation we do have around um, looking at what's important. Um, if, if people uh, were able to, we could all move away from our own dictations of ego and look to a bigger piece. That's what I would change because I think everything else falls into place after that. What's your biggest weakness? Uh, uh, my biggest weakness, uh, details. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, am not great at details. I, a little secret, uh, I'm dyslexic. And so um, details are a little tough for me anyway and just by personality. So I, I struggle uh, with uh, making sure I have all the, the, uh, the T's crossed and the eyes dotted. That's, that's my big one. What's your biggest strength? Well, as probably the mirror of that being dyslexic, uh, people will tell you that who are dyslexic, that we see things differently. Um, we just have a, and, and often when I'm in a consulting relationship, part of what I bring to the table is the fact that I just see things from a different angle. Um, and I, I wish I could tell you exactly why that is, but I've talked with enough dyslexics to know that we share that. Uh, we, I often am uh, told by people why, you know, you just see things a little bit differently than, than I do. And uh, so my biggest strength is that I can approach things from a, a different side. If you could only have one book to read, what's that book going to be? Uh, probably Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Do you have a favorite sound? My favorite sound is uh, waves on the shore. Uh, that's that's the soothing sound that I always uh, associate with calmness and quiet. Um, just to follow up on that, one of the things I like to do is paddleboard. And I've had several experiences being um, in saltwater, ocean, big water, where it, it suddenly there's that moment where you realize you're part of everything. And that sound brings me back to that memory of the fact that we're all a part of everything. And Lee, if someone wants to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, if there, there is an interest in um, the thriving piece, uh, my new website, thethriveprinciples.com, uh, will give links both to my new book, uh, The Thrive, Prin Thrive Principles, and it also gives a link to the Thriveology podcast, which is a, a great place to, to do that. Also, it, it kind of links you up to my Twitter feed, so um, that's a great place to find me. And what parting advice would you like to leave with us today? Uh, the big thing, um, I know your thing is about uh, dealing with fear. And I think that is such a crucial piece in life because it, it, we have this orientation of avoiding fear. And, and I would just like to switch that around and to say that if something's important, you're going to feel the fear. And, and the question is not so much um, how you uh, avoid it, because what I've noticed is uh, we get stronger walking towards fear and the fear gets stronger when we keep avoiding things. The more we avoid the fear, the bigger it takes hold of our life. And so the big thing is to orient life towards pushing towards the fear, even redefine the, the fear and, and understand that that fear is um, a level of importance. It's just an importance indicator to pay attention. That's the big one. Sounds like excellent advice. I want to also let everyone know, too, that Lee has generously donated a copy of his book, The Thrive Principles, to be given away. So if you'd like the opportunity to win that book, visit the giveaways page at livingbeyondyourfears.com to submit your free entry form today. Remember, the competition only lasts seven days, and there are multiple ways for you to enter, and they're all free. So do it today. Lee, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today, not only because you shared your story, but you just gave us such a wealth of information, and I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, Billy, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me today. And remember, you cannot achieve everything, but you do have the God-given ability to achieve anything. So stay focused, out of fear, and keep on keeping on. Until next time, be well and peaceful. 
For more information on today's episode and guest, or for resources that will assist you in overcoming your fears, visit livingbeyondyourfears.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, where three times a week we move to a life beyond our fears.